Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? This week we have a lot of news on vaccines, both those for the CCP virus and other conditions. There's also interesting news on who is and is not taking the vaccines for the CCP virus, a lesson that could theoretically be extended to other conditions. We have more news on some bizarre experiments, particularly how you can cook a chicken without ever having to actually cook the chicken. You can find timestamps for these and other news items from this week in the description box below. Let's start with the initial trials for the Pfizer vaccine and the South African variant of the CCP virus. The South African variant has been more difficult to handle since it appears to be at least somewhat resistant to the other vaccines that are currently on the market. Of the options that are available in America, the Pfizer vaccine appears to be the most reliable when it comes to ability to be effective against all strains, whether that's the Brazilian, South African, UK, and others that are gradually developing as a result of the difficulty in tackling the CCP virus. The results, as released by Pfizer, indicate that after clinical trials, their vaccine is still effective against the South African variant. This is a phase 3 trial involving 12,000 individuals. The protection remained even after 6 months. The only downside to this is that it's 6 months after the second dose. A relatively small hurdle, but something to be aware of. The largest study for the approval as it is now for the Pfizer vaccine included 44,000 people. Of these, less than 1,000 developed the CCP virus, and of those, 77 had received the vaccine. That means it was 91.3% effective. Efficacy, when you look at the CDC definition, moves up to 95.3%, as only 21 of those 77 individuals had severe infections. That is a substantial improvement over some of the other vaccines out there, which can have as little as 90% efficacy for those that are approved in America at present. Compared to some of the other international offerings, it's a much more significant improvement. Next is something of an information piece from Scientific American. It's there primarily to explain just how the vaccines work, and whether or not having side effects is a sign of efficacy. It starts out by describing a particular person's experience, and then goes on to explain how this can be compared to others. The question was whether or not someone with an extreme reaction, or a rather mild reaction, to the vaccination are going to receive the same degree of protection. This is useful for people to understand that Having the side effects or symptoms from the vaccination isn't necessarily an indicator of greater effectiveness. Some individuals simply won't have the same discomfort or side effects that others will. That's where the Scientific American article comes in to explain even more on both immunity and how a vaccine can be effective. If you're interested in understanding both how the virus infects you, and how your body deals with it after receiving the vaccine, it's a useful read. While on the topic of infections and similar, we should talk about how effective it is to have a natural immunity to the CCP virus. In short, not very. A third of those who have been infected by the CCP virus and had to go to hospital will go back again and that's within four months. That's a fairly high readmission rate. 33% or thereabouts will return within four months of leaving hospital. This is an example of why trying to bring down the bell curve was incredibly important early on, and arguably in some places still is, even if the approaches aren't being used correctly. This readmission data comes from analysing 48,000 patients between August and December. They found that the hospitalisation readmission rates for death 
were substantially higher, four to eight times higher, than in those that weren't readmitted, yet another disconcerting figure. While readmission occurs quite frequently up to four months after discharge, symptoms can persist for even longer. In fact, a third of patients can have neurological or psychiatric problems directly tied to the CCP virus six months after being treated for it. This is on top of many other issues we've mentioned on a long-term basis. There is a substantial trend from CCP virus towards patients having long-term systemic issues, lung function, heart damage, psych symptoms. The list goes on. The study in this case from The Lancet looks at more than 230,000 patients, 34% of whom had been diagnosed with a psychiatric condition within six months. Anxiety accounted for 17%, mood disorders 14%, and of the total number, 13% found that it was their first diagnosis of a mental disorder. Simply taking the study size, there's more than 26,000 individuals who were otherwise previously completely healthy, now experiencing psychiatric disorders. Statistically, you're more likely to develop these if you had both severe CCP virus infections and were hospitalized. This is another issue that could possibly be related to the previous item we discussed, in which many patients were being readmitted to hospital. This is yet another concern and one of a growing body of concerns around the CCP virus and just how big a problem it could be for the medical system, both in the short term and in the long term. While still on the topic of the CCP virus, we should mention just what it will take to get people to go with the vaccine and take it up. There is a disconcerting proportion of individuals who aren't willing or have reticence to the vaccine. This seems to owe to misinformation and misunderstanding about what is happening. That coupled with some of the more hyperbolic news about side effects such as blood clots means people are very wary of it. But there is one group that's more likely to accept the vaccine than others. Within America, that appears to be atheists. There's an up to 90% participation rate. The next highest is 80% with agnostics. Below that, you start looking at, at Catholic Hispanics and white individuals, with an average of 77%. Below that, you have evangelicals, and then Protestants and so on. That's an interesting statistic. Why exactly the atheist population and then agnostic population is more willing to accept the vaccine than others is not clearly explained, although it could be possibly down to differences in lifestyles, income, education, and so on. There could also be other factors that we have not considered yet. In other CCP virus related news, we have interesting research into how to counter the virus itself, particularly how to inactivate it. It appears that sunlight, and specifically the UVB part of sunlight, will inactivate the RNA of the virus. This is particularly useful as UV radiation is a more convenient means of sterilizing the environment rather than directly applying sanitizing agents such as bleach, alcohol, and other chemicals that could cause damage or be harmful to the environment. Sunlight is mostly useful for many living organisms, at least as far as plants and similar go. In the case of humans, well, it's a matter of the dose makes the poison. 20 minutes of exposure to UVB in particular, but UV light in general, is enough to sanitize most surfaces. This is limited to non-porous surfaces. The penetrative ability of the UV radiation is somewhat limited, and this is a problem. If you have something where the virus has become impregnated into it, the surface may be sanitized, but the inside may not be, and this is one of the limitations in using UV radiation. Next is some debunking that's necessary. Recently, the idea of vaccine passports have been circulating. 
there are certain groups pushing back against this idea, often arguing that it's unnecessary, an invasion of privacy, and all manner of other nonsense. The problem with this is that they seem to be unaware or ignorant of history. Particularly notable is that vaccine passports are not a novel idea. In fact, they've been used historically during similar major outbreaks in different ways. The last time that vaccine passports were used on the scale that's being proposed now was around the turn of the 19th century. At this time, smallpox was rampant, and there was a viable vaccine for it. In order to travel into places like America, you would need to have some sort of proof that you had been vaccinated for smallpox. This would allow easy entry into the country. If you did not have that proof, you would have to go through somewhere like Alice Island. Considering the benefits that we've mentioned for the vaccines in different ways, the idea of being vaccinated shouldn't be that unpleasant a thought. The idea of being able to prove that you have been vaccinated isn't that difficult with modern technology. Most electronic passports would be able to achieve exactly the same functionality. When you look at the international stage, travel at the moment is restricted to pretty much only those who are in very specific business categories. Tourism has gone away almost entirely. This is because there is concern that an individual traveling could either bring or pick up and bring back the virus. A passport would allow an individual to prove that they're not at risk of either thing occurring. They're not going to bring the CCP virus, nor are they going to carry it back to their original country. This would help in streamlining the travel process for all involved. It would be very little different to the use of a modern, standard travelling passport. In fact, arguably, it would make their trip that much easier. Rather than having to sit through a quarantine period or have to worry about proving something that's more difficult, simply presenting a document that proves that you have indeed been vaccinated would be more than enough to allow the resumption of travel, and as a result, hopefully move back to most countries' tourism industries. Going now from the CCP virus, instead we're going to look at another virus. Particularly, we're going to look at HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. While it's taken roughly a year to develop and then deploy vaccines for the CCP virus, work on a HIV vaccine has been going for decades. It has been incredibly difficult, not the least of which is because of the means by which HIV hides from the immune system. This makes it difficult to deal with, even if you have a vaccine. The fundamental process of taking the virus, denaturing it, and then presenting it to the immune system doesn't work because of the way the HIV will work. It occupies certain immune cells that then aren't able to allow it to be targeted. This effectively blinds the immune system to its presence. This is why a phase 1 clinical trial which found 97% effectiveness in generating antibodies is extremely promising news. While very preliminary, it is a very good indicator of what might come and just how far along we are in developing a vaccine for HIV. While vaccines are in development across the board for many different diseases, there's also a strong pushback from anti-vaxxers. The question then is just how much influence they have, and the answer is surprisingly large. This article coming out of The Guardian looks at just how many anti-vaxxers it takes to start the spread of disinformation. They conclude that it takes only 12 individuals to get the ball rolling. Although the contents aren't limited to just anti-vaxxers, it can be expanded to include just about every conspiracy theory out there, of which anti-vaxxers are just a small section. The number itself is misleading though. The way they've reached this is that they tried to trace back the anti-vaccine content on platforms like Facebook and Twitter. In doing so, they found that the majority, roughly 65%, was produced by those 12 people. People like Robert F. Kennedy, 
they are better known and quite notorious anti-vaxxers to say the least. The article does mention one particularly strong method to avoid issues around media bias and being taken in by these rather influential individuals. That is, teach students what they call media literacy. This is just a new way of saying critical thinking and evaluative skills, something that for a long time was included in education and then phased out in favour of various other theories and approaches to education. Bringing back critical thinking skills would benefit both the ability to analyse this information that's presented to them and ask the appropriate questions, such as what citations do they have? Is this an authoritative source? Is their methodology robust? Why should I believe this individual? And more. It is an approach that has proven extremely effective in Finland, where it's being used to exactly this effect, and why Finland is considered one of the most resistant nations to misinformation and fake news. Going from ways to handle actual fake news to something that looks like it should be, there's a YouTube video that's been published relatively recently. It was a video of a man trying to cook a chicken by slapping it. While we have previously mentioned that there are ways to cook a chicken and just how much energy it would take to do so, the idea of actually doing it this way seems a little extreme. The fact that someone's taken the time and effort to do so is surprising to say the least. We mention this because in 2019 there was a Reddit post that calculated exactly what would be needed to achieve the result as shown in the video. The process took approximately 8 hours and 135,000 slaps from the device that was created for this purpose. It also consumed up to 3 times more energy than a conventional oven would need for the same functionality. As a result, although technically interesting, engineering interesting, and physics interesting, this is not practical. On the topic of chickens, we should ask which came first, the chicken or the egg? The answer is the egg, but not in the case of this video. Recent research was looking at whether or not your cheap egg is just as good as your high-end, free-ranging or organic egg is going to be. The reality is most eggs should be just about the same as far as what they consist of. A hard shell, and yolk, and a white. Despite this, depending on the circumstances in which the chickens are purported to be raised and managed, you can be charged many times the price. Just to get a dozen eggs, you might pay four or five times more than what you would pay for something that's been made in other methods, cages perhaps being the most common. The testing was there to look at the amount of cholesterol, protein, omega-3, vitamins A, D, and E. This was all sent to an accredited lab and analysed to see if there was a difference in the brand and the purported quality of the egg based on the prices that we've mentioned. To spoil the results, there was practically no difference between the expensive eggs and the cheap eggs. In fact, the cage eggs were half the price of some of the more expensive organic eggs, something they meant not surprise you if you're familiar with organic versus conventional farming. The cage-raised eggs tended to have a higher level of some vitamins than the organic counterparts. This is also somewhat true of organic growing in general. Organic farms tend to have lower yields and slightly lower contents of certain vitamins and nutrients than conventional farming methods have. This owes to the nature of how the crops are grown, where they're grown and what's in them. In a similar manner, we would expect to find the same, and what they have found here, true of organic versus caged or conventionally grown eggs. The only noteworthy exception to this was your omega-3 levels. There was 0.13 grams of omega-3 in the organic eggs compared to 0.05 grams of conventional eggs. 
And the article goes into a lot more detail on exactly where and how the differences show up. But in short, whichever egg you buy, you're likely to get roughly the same final product in the end. The minor differences in exact concentrations of things like omega-3 isn't worth noting in any particular detail. The final article we have for you this week is all about early humans, long before we domesticated chickens, in fact long before we were doing anything that could be considered modern domestication. This is still back when we were hunter-gatherers, if not even earlier. It's all about how the earliest humans were walking upright, despite us not yet having developed the complex brains that we have, both now and several million years ago. The modern brain as you know it now is thought to have developed possibly one and a half million years ago. This would have given us more advanced processing capacity in the periphery of our brain, in that cortex. That meant we could think and plan. One of the changes that came around this time was that we would walk upright, going from apes that would use all four limbs when traveling to apes that used only two limbs when traveling allowed us to do more along the way, carry things, use tools, and more. Although thought to have only developed one and a half million years ago, it's now theorized that it could have been 1.7 million years ago. That's how long ago the brain developed in a way that allowed us to do what we were doing in the advanced ways that we were. This isn't something that can be seen directly though. It had to be found out by analysing the internal markings on the skulls of remains from that far back. This means that humans were already walking on two feet before the brain started developing the way it has. Around this time, the brain was already similar to some of our great ape cousins now. The second big discovery coming out of this study is that, with remains found from 1.8 to 1.7 million years ago, their brains weren't as developed. This is a big distinction, as you have different waves of migration out of Africa. It would appear that some of the populations that did migrate out of Africa in that early period didn't have the same large developed brain that you see in modern humans. When you take fossils from later migrations, they appear to show the evidence of a developed brain. That means you have very different driving forces to movement of humans out of that continent. That's all the news we have for you this week. Thank you for watching. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions or suggestions that you have below.